from the drugs and bouts in the city club bombs and clouds Yeah, that's an important one. Um, it comes from a, a Latin word, pagani, which basically means culture or hillbilly or country dweller. And it was used as a disparaging phrase by people who lived in Christianized urban Rome for people in the countryside still believing in the old ways. Now, there's huge misconceptions about paganism. I don't dress like Gandalf. I don't act, you know, I don't, I don't, <laughs> someone gave me a staff today, but, so <laughs> the irony of that, but uh, the, uh, it basically paganism is all the religions, all the spiritual traditions that are not Abrahamic, so outside Judaism, Christianity and Islam, and that would include things like Shintoism, Hinduism and uh, Indo-European paganism, which comes from the same root as Hinduism. Now, uh, basically, there's, I'm, I'm we talking, when I talk paganism, I'm talking about the Indo-European route. So that's where all the Hellenic paganism, Greek paganism, Celtic paganism, Nordic paganism, Slavic paganism all comes from. And you hear a lot of nonsense saying, oh, it's a nature worshipping religion. No, that, that was all made up by fellas trying to get laid back in the 1960s and stuff like that. <laughs> it's nothing like that at all. It's, yes, that's an element to it. But the maximums are predominantly things like a, a belief in reincarnation is very central, that there's no terminal moment, that there's no, no saviour coming, there's, no, there's nothing coming to save your ass, you've got to do it yourself. And so there's no you know, godhead that's going to come to earth and fix things. And everything is secular. So everything, the universe and the cosmos and your own life and everything works in gigantic circles of cycles. That, that come around, and like they call it the yugas in the Hindu world. And even in the Irish tradition, we have that as well. Now, uh, I think that's the main reason is like, there's no salvation to create, and there's no book. There's no rule book in the pagan traditions that have commandments to do anything. There's mythological texts, there's inspiring texts like the Bhagavad Gita in Hinduism, but there's no defining, you must do this, you must do that. Because, and it's the same reason I'm, I'm an anarchist. It has faith in humans to do the right thing. That if you're left alone, you won't want to dominate anybody. You won't want to impose upon anybody. And when I used to live in America, I remember meeting this person who said to me once, well, if we did not have the Bible, we wouldn't have morality. And I'll talk about this later. Now, just think what an incredible statement that is. You need a book to tell you how to behave like a human being, a decent person. So that was that even that was that Bible Belt thing in the South, you know. But that was a real wake-up moment for me because it made me realise that why they exterminated us, why we've been wiped out. Uh, you know, there's it was the predominant religion of Europe, and there's only a handful of us left now. Well, it's growing, but and a Wicca, by the way, is not paganism. Wicca is a form of Abrahamic faith, and it's not involved in that because they they worship uh, biblical de deities. But anyway, that's what it is. That's what a paganism is, Louise. That's what. <laughs> That's it, <laughs> and magic. <laughs> and, uh, and the belief that you can change reality is a big part. That's a belief that you can actually physically change reality through thought processes. So magic is central, but well, that just means the creative mind can actually change things. And that's what's happening here today. This is, this is an act of magic. You know what's happening here. A new reality is being born in this room. So that's basically paganism. That's basically it. <laughs> Um, Madame and Thomas, uh, we're actually not going to debate uh, here. We're going to have a conversation, and I thought we'll all, we'll all have a conversation. Because um, I think this is a very urgent moment that we're arriving at, we've arrived at. And what is it? Well, you might say that we are gathered around the deathbed of our civilization. Things are not looking good, you know. The guy in the bed is struggling for breath. There's a rumour that Jesus is on the way. 
He's in a taxi on the way from Cork Airport. <laughs> but I'm not counting on it. I'm not counting on it. Is that a heresy? I don't know. But I'm not counting on it. So it's up to us to save this guy in the bed. And as Thomas says, and I think we have the means to do it. We have, we have the means to do it. Our civilization is one of the richest civilizations in the world, as we kind of touched on in bits and pieces, and which you know about anyway. And it's under attack. It's been under attack visibly for three years in the most vicious way. Increasingly, even, even this morning my wife told me about the appalling episode in Santry last night where a bunch of elderly people were basically told to go fuck themselves by hundreds of police officers and hundreds of migrants. Yeah. And nobody says anything except the president bleats on the late late about our duty to the third world and the fourth world and the seventh world and all everybody else except to our own decent people who built this country and preserved it. I've been writing about religion and Christianity and all that stuff, or thought I was, I tried to, for years, and I always get into trouble because everybody only hears what they already know. If you talk about Christianity, then they, that means you're defending Vatican and the Rome. You, you can't actually say anything new. It's very important that we understand the subtleties of this discussion because it has been, we have lost a, an awful lot through the lack of subtlety. We're descending into a cesspit of filth in our country. It's quite obvious. It's bizarre. It's absurd, it's, it's incomprehensible, but it is happening. You see government ministers squawking because a man isn't around to punch around in women's clothes. We hear, you know, people uh, claiming that it's an outrage and an injustice that they're not allowed to talk to children about sex. Who, who thinks that? <laughs> who thinks it's an outrage if you're not allowed to talk to children about sex? Perverts think that. So, there's a book which is written by a guy called Pr Philip Reif, an American sociologist and, and, and cultural critic, in 2006. It was the first of a trilogy. This book was called uh, My Life Among the Death Works. Death works is a phrase he uses for cultural icons that are instructive. But his thesis is really interesting because it, it is prophetic of Ireland's f f trajectory at the very end, in the very last few years. He divides up the culture into three worlds, but he doesn't mean first, second, third world in the context that we normally understand those terms. He means it in cultural terms. And he says there are three forms of culture, first world culture, second world culture, and third world culture. And Europe is the third world culture. America is the third world culture in this paradigm. And what he, first it is what Thomas has talked about. It's, it's the ancient uh, uh, traditions, the pagan uh, past, uh, the, the ancient Greece, American Indians, all those ancient civilizations which uh, had their own deep understandings many thousands of years ago, you know, going back thousands of years. And, and uh, he said, Rafe said, those cultures are built, built on the concept of fate, F A T E, and taboos. And then the second world is the Abraham, Abrahamic, in our terms, Christian Catholic, uh, uh, which is built, built on faith, F I I T H, and commandments. But both of these cultures have in common that they are transcendent. They are seeking a transcendent reality in their imagination so as to construct a functional society. And Sigmund Freud talked about in the Civilization and its Discontents. This was his key point, even though he was an atheist. He, he was writing about the fact that, Christi you know, that Christianity essentially had enabled the construction of Western civilization through the sublimation particularly of the sexual instinct. In other words, that th that was ameliorated or it was reduced in order to prevent it being the energy of the humanity being squandered in a way that was unproductive. And out of that blossomed Western civilization. But the third world culture, according to Reef, is where all of this flips. And when you, if you were to hear his, his description, he's describing modern Ireland, because he says everything goes to filth. Everything goes into its opposite. There's an inversion. There is an amnesia. Good is bad. Bad is good. Pornography is rife. The evildoers are celebrated. The good are uh, repudiated. 
This is our culture now. This is the cause of the man, the, the person in the bed who is dying. And that's, I think, essentially what we face in our culture now. We have in Ireland, again, for the, not for the first time, we have a laboratory specimen of a culture that has gone through that in very clear living memory. And it's not living memory, but in, in, the, in the sense of the, that we are able to recall. Our, 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 cult, our country is studded with uh, pagan sites. These are the richest part of our visual landscape in terms of its the, the man-made iconography in it. We have the Christian story. And now we are leading the world in the race to the bottom, vying with Canada to become the, the most batshit crazy country in the world. I'm, I'm proud of it. Proud of it. So, pride. Proud. Just a few more days before we have to leave the country. <laughs> I was awakened to this very urgently by COVID, by the COVID episode, because it seemed to me that the followers of Jesus Christ who said, you know, embrace the lepers, when they were on standing on the altar, masked, washing their hands in, in this chemical before they were taking up the body and blood of Jesus Christ, didn't really believe what they were doing. You know, leaving aside all the paraphernalia of COVID aspect, just think about that. Did these guys actually believe that this was Jesus Christ and that what he said was true? No. No. Now, there were some exceptions, but they were at a low level, they were largely invisible, they were certainly not vocal. Nobody stood up against these guys, the leaders, and said, no, this is not the way. That tells us that we're in big trouble. Any of those of us who continue to believe, or continue to observe, or continue to practice, have a real problem. Because they still haven't stood up and said we were wrong. They still haven't said it was a mistake. Because if they were even now to do that, they could actually save lots of people from what's happening. But they absolutely dog and refuse. And then, in another context, briefly, the mass migration context, they're telling people lies. They're telling people lies about the teaching of their own church. If people read what Thomas Aquinas said about mass migration, he believes what I believe. He believes what I believe. Which is that it should be a hard thing to come and join another nation. It should not be easy. It should not be possible to become a member of another nation by that the Prime Minister or the Vice Prime taking 1,100 quid of a petty cash and buying you a citizenship and saying, no, there you're Irish. Anybody who says you're not is a racist. That shouldn't be possible. So that's where we are. I think this is, how, this is the critical context. Because my understanding of it, Thomas, is that it was to a large extent, and I may be wrong, you, you, and please contradict me, was that it was a largely seamless growth over a long period between uh, paganism and Christianity, that they kind of morphed in and uh, together. And that particularly the Normans, I gather, were very much part of this kind of process of change and, and growth. And we were all, as it were, part of one organism at that time. That's when, when I look back, that's what I feel and see. And that this changed maybe in the last, after the famines, that there was a kind of a retrenchment of Christianity for reasons that may or may not be well-intentioned, I don't know. Uh, but certainly, you know, the, the, one of the, the explanations I've heard was that there was a ballooning of population prior to the famine, and which caused, which exacerbated I'm using the famine, by the way, in quotation marks. <laughs> uh, that because of this, that there was a felt of a need to control population growth. I don't know if that's true. It's plausible. But the result of it, what followed then was what they called the devotion revolution and so on, and, and uh, really an attempt to control uh, sexuality in that Freudian almost sense, you know, in a different way, but in the same sense, you know, but it was, it turned into something entirely negative. And now I'm almost inclined to think that actually when we now learn about all the long-term plans of our puppet masters, was this part of their scenario, was this part of their thinking that if they could create a very dark brooding form of, of, of 
Christianity in Ireland that we would be the most vociferous in rejecting it and would go faster and deeper to the bottom in order to show that we weren't any more being sat upon by bishops. Something like that. The distorted part of Christianity in Ireland, it seems to me, is in the last 150 years. That before that, it was actually quite a different story. Yeah, that's, it, it's a really complicated, long story. You know, you'd need days to really talk about it. But something happened in the Middle Ages, definitely. And during the Confederacy Wars, when England converted to Presbyterianism and had Cromwell coming to Ireland, and you had like the Lutherans doing all the witch burnings in Europe and stuff like that, where they weren't really, they were really sectarian things. And a polarization happened that drove basically Christianity and Europe apart, like pulling at itself. So therefore, you know, you had to sort, well, look at this country, you know, we were torn, torn in two by two different branches of, of Christianity. Uh, and there was a polarization that stepped in. The, this classic thing of the fear of the other. This wasn't people from abroad. These were Irish people that were just a different fate. And I think that had a huge part to do with it. I think the schism that really came about from the Middle Ages and then leading up to the Reformation and that period, someone, when you had the split and you had like the Cromwellian invasion and stuff. And I think at that point, that darkness, that sort of like, I, I, you know that you do hear about this kind of Irish Catholic darkness. Mm. I think that took root then. I think it was a, a nihilism really, because I mean one fifth of the population of this country was exterminated in the Confederacy Wars over what? Dif a slight different translation of the Bible. Just think about that. If you had to pare it all down to one thing, right? One thing. Uh, the translation of the Bible from Latin into German led to one fifth of the po population of this country being killed. So it was, only, it was obvious there was going to be a darkness, a, that sectarian thing would start building up. And I think that's what led to that sort of like intensity where you weren't just, but prior to that, you just had your God and your religion and your church and your priest, but it was politicized. It was politicized by the British occupation, or the English occupation of Ireland, basically and the planters and all that stuff. And I think it, it fostered a cult mentality within the, the Catholics. They really, especially after the famine, I couldn't imagine what Ireland was like after the famine. Like, are we going to survive? Will we even exist, you know? You're never going to come out of that normal, you know? You're never going to come, you re, I was reading something about the, the workhouses and the amount of people that died in Sligo. And you read this, and this actually happened down the road from me. And that went on everywhere. So how could you have a functional society after something like that? So I think, okay, just to change it, that indicates a spiritual damage, okay? Your, the spiritual nature of the people was somehow damaged. But that was damaged by trauma, the trauma of an appalling history. I don't care what anyone says, what we're dealing with right now is absolutely a spiritual battle. I don't care what religion you come from. Or, yeah, it's true. And if, 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 if you're an atheist, it's still apparent. I can remember during the first part of the lockdown, when we, when we got to know each other, there was one day I was sitting there and I just was switching on the internet and there was someone like Claire Bourne, or one of the RT propagandists, uh, psychological terrorists, and I was overcome with a sense of pure evil. And I, said, and I was like, I've never been in this place before. But I, it felt like, when you read stories, I mean, I wrote a book 10 years ago on psychopaths in Wall Street, but I, I had to read a lot of criminal documents, and I read about serial killers. And they would talk about the fear of a person, say Ted Bundy had them in the back of a van, or someone like that, in the back of a van. And, and once you would escape, they said, you know what evil is when you're completely captured by it. And that's exactly the feeling I had in summer 2020. Not only is this a kind of a political machination that they're playing a mind game on us, but I was looking at those people on the, the TV and I said, you're from the abyss. You're here representing some spiritual force that has come upon this planet and you're not me. And, and 
you, where have you, like, where have you gone? Where have you gone? It was like mass possession. You know, you can have these things. They talk about in, this, in the classical literature of not only an individual being possessed by a demon, a thing called an egregore, where the entire behavior of a certain power structure becomes demonic in itself, and it becomes a self-perpetuating, self-feeding demon. Very interesting thing. It's a, it comes from Greek a classical religion. And that's what I was feeling. And I have no doubts about that. And, and I'll tell you something else. As soon as I figured out that it was spiritual, I stopped being upset about it. Because it was like the thing, I feckin' know what you are now. And now I know how to beat you. So, remember during the lockdown, they kept pushing the boundaries. You know, they got cocky. They, cut, they thought they could get away with everything, right? Now that's pathological, right? Uh, I think this, I think because if you look at all the leaders in the world and in Ireland and every country, they're mediocre, right? What's the most dangerous man on the earth? A weak, frightened little man who has power and is terrified of losing it. They will do anything. And because they're so spiritually blank, dead inside, this egregorial, demonic force took hold. And I'm sorry, but I saw actual actual sadism in some of Radker's uh, speeches, where I saw the smirk, the duper's delight, that rush, that rush of norepinephrine from the back, from the, back, the lower brainstem flooding around his optic nerves, and you're going like that. You know, uh, we might never, we might never be able to fly ever again. <laughs> you know, and uh, coupled with his mediocrity. Don't be afraid of these people. These were, the, these were the geeks in your school who, you know, the girls didn't want to go out with them and stuff like that. And now they're having, you know, that whole, this talking to two fellas earlier on. I grew up in a mixed school, but they said that the worst thing in rural Ireland was the school dances for a fella to cross the, the dance floor to go talk to a girl. They wouldn't have even got off the chair. <laughs> We, so that's what we're up against. It's really not that bad. The frightening thing is that it pollutes other people around us. And that clarity we got of the last three years of like realizing people that you might have like loved and they turned to be an enormous disappointment. Or they, they became like fascist, totalitarian, you know? That, but those clarities are needed because a lot of people today don't step into consciousness. That was a kind of a thing, like Carl Jung spoke about the time he saw a dead boy in the river in Switzerland and he stopped being a child, he stepped into consciousness. And this is why they have a permanent adolescence. You know, there's, where you often said, where are the adults? They have a vested interest in keeping everyone a child and not having that step into consciousness. And when so many people, like imagine all of you in the room, when they start to say things like, well, you haven't got a choice, like Bill Gates, you haven't got a choice, you know, I think. <laughs> that should have, that, that stepped some of us, like, who the hell are you? Who the hell are you, you know, to tell me I have to have this? Well, that was your step in the consciousness. But because they'd infantiled so many people, they didn't step into consciousness, so many of them. Uh, but it will happen to many of them. It's, it's, it has been happen, happening uh, in a different way. So remember that. It's evil. It's dangerous. But... You know, a demon doesn't have the same power as a god. That's the way I'd put it. And we are closer to godhood than they'll ever be. And always remember that because it is a force we can take down. Easy. We've had these discussions and I mean, I've listened an awful lot to Thomas's thing and I find it hugely convincing Although at some other level in myself, I, I refuse to really accept it as be, be, beyond the metaphorical level. Um, and I seek then to create kind of schema for it in reality, whether it's through behavioral psychology or various tricks, groupthink mechanisms and all of this kind of stuff. But at the same time, I recognize that it is evil. It is evil. And however we kind of articulate that, there's no question. And that, it, it seems to me, is a consequence of the flipping of the, the understandings of religion. And I don't necessarily mean that that's about morality, because I, I don't think that morality is the point in this 
thing. Morality is just a sort of a tabulation of rules that, that kind of, uh, like the commandments, which are almost like a, a aid memoir to remember what's right and what's wrong, you know, if you need it. I think we fail to understand some of the most fundamental points of the religious imagination. Because in a sense, it is about imagination. And people always think, well, that means you're saying it's about mythology and it's about, you know, it's fantasy or it's made up. Yes and no. You know, th there's a part of the human brain, I think, which we're not using, in which both are and are possible, you know? It's possible to believe something and at the same time to have a suspicion that it might not be true, but nevertheless, the belief is strong enough. The belief in its solidity as a fact, a fact of belief, is sufficient to sustain it in culture. And that's the most important thing. What we do in, in our own minds is our own business, in that sense, in my opinion. I'm not here to say what I believe or don't believe or argue about belief or whether God exists or doesn't exist. I'm talking about the necessity that a culture has to be able to supply to its members a current of belief that will sustain them in this reality. And that's because I believe that the human is structured in this way that we're structured to move. We're structured to move to reality, into space and time. We're going somewhere. We're moving towards some destination, and that's our demeanor. As you grow older, you realize that all the things that, you, that attract you, that drive you crazy, and that you want more than anything, when you get them, they don't satisfy you. It's a passing thing. You kind of move through to the next phase, the next thing. And that's... That's the dynamic of the human mechanism, if you want to put it technologically. Why not in this technological age? Actually, lots of reasons why not, but it's the best I can come up with at the moment. And that's what we've lost fundamentally in losing our transcendent imagination. One of the most fundamental things is that sense of the space of reality and the time the in, of, infinite, uh, of, of the infinite. How long is the infinite? Where does the infinite go in space? How long is eternal? There's a difference between a person who lives in a bunker, what Pope Benedict called the bunker of a society that man has built, like this tent, say. Not as high as this tent, say. Where we live here in this tent, and everything is clear to us. The temperature is the same all the time. The light is the same all the time. We know we could walk around it in our uh, bare feet in the dark and not bump into each other, type of thing. But to actually live in reality is a different matter. So the and that's what f religion, faith, gives you. It gives you the capacity to stretch yourself fully in reality. That's, so what's, that flip that's happened is not a moral question. It's the loss of that understanding of human capacity. And, and, and in a certain sense, not so much omnipotence, but the, the access to all power in the world, in the universe. That, Thomas mentioned fear. When you have that, you're not afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. You're moving towards a meaning, you're moving meaningfully towards a des destination that is there. And you can feel confident that what is happening to you is meant to happen on that journey. It's not random. Our culture tells us everything is random. It's just an accident. It's just, just, you know, here we are in, in Fermoy, but we could just as easily be in Tobercory or Castle Bar. It's just a matter of luck, toss it a coin. If something else had happened on Thursday, we wouldn't be here. That's not true. That's the wrong way to see reality. The way to see reality is that I am here now and I am nowhere else. That's an unchangeable fact. It's the only solid fact that I can say about my existence right now. I don't know how long I'm going to live. I don't know, you know whether I'm going to sleep tonight. I don't know, you know what time I'm going to get out of here. You know, but I know that I'm here now. And it's a different way of thinking about reality. This is the religious way of thinking rea about reality. Whether it's paganism or Christianity or Islam or whatever, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, all, it's similar. This is what we've lost. And this is why these things are happening to us. These things that we talk about could not happen to a culture to which this had not already happened. So therefore, the, in order to, to, to stop this happening, to reverse it, we need to reverse what's happened. 
we need to change the fundamentals. And that's a big story. I mean, uh, we talked earlier about it, Thomas himself, you know, but uh, this guy Reef, he talks about death works. And it's very interesting, he talks about, a death work is a work which basically attacks the culture. And he said, this is a new thing since the 60s. And we kind of think, okay, pop music, blah, blah, all that, you know. Now, I'm not slagging hot pop music, far from it. Because one of the things I've realized is that even though I've become more and more aware of, to a certain extent, the damage done by pop culture, I also love it. So that's what you call neurosis. <laughs> I'm a neurotic. Culture and neurotic. I think we all are. But I was reading something about it in the last few days, and, and uh, Reeve talks about Finnegan's Wake as being almost the, the perfect death work. It teaches, he says, in reading you learn how to destroy a culture by, by, by parodying and attacking the culture, by ridiculing the culture in words. A song that also gets mentioned is, uh, in this context is to kind of almost like emblemize the, the, the pop culture thing is Sympathy for the Devil. Now that's a really interesting song because I actually today only thought about it for the first time in a long time and I would have said, well it's kind of satanic isn't it, Sympathy for the Devil isn't it, well actually it's not at all. The, 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 con the title doesn't appear in the song but it is the devil speaking. And what the do devil is doing, he's telling you what he's already done and he's telling you what he's going to do next. It's all there. He said, I killed Kennedy. We ki you know, uh, uh, because, you know, we could. He was there in, in, in St. Petersburg when the Tsar was killed and his ministers. And uh, Anastasia was, was uh, screaming in pain. He says, every cop was a criminal. And the sinners are all saints. Well, that's last night in Dublin, in Santry and in Montrose, where that little shit from Ars and Ultron was pretending to be a saint because he lets in the whole world again. <laughs> so, just a bit. So, look, it's, you see, this is the point, or near one of the points. The problem is when you, in the last, in my lifetime, and certainly in the later years, uh, if you talked about religion, you were ipso facto a reactionary. And, and that's really stupid. But it's also wrong in the sense that, yes, it can go into that stuff very easily and does, let's be honest. But like, I, I, don't see, I don't see that useful, as useful. I love the Rolling Stones. I don't think they wrote that song, though. They're not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> that's just by the way. Uh, but, I, you know, I, wrote, I did an exhibition in Remini uh, uh, 10, 13, 12, 13 years ago called Rock and Roll as a Quest for the Infinite. And that's what I was trying to do was create an antithesis, an antidote to this, to the death work. To actually see that actually what had happened to a great deal of music was that it had become a kind of a Trojan horse not for Satanism, for, for the antithesis, for the belief in the transcendent, for the belief in good and, and, and hope and all of those great things. And I think that's true. So, you know, there's a kind of a wave going on now where everybody, you know, that all rock and roll is all satanic and, you know, the, the Beatles didn't invite the wrong music and so on and so on. The Rolling Stones didn't write that song, definitely, I'm certain of that. But I think they wrote some of the other ones. But, I made this fundamental mistake when I was a young guy, when I was 17, 18. I thought from all the stuff that I was hearing from the church and all the rest of it, that I had to make a choice between Elvis and Jesus. <laughs> and I chose Elvis. <laughs> it's no wonder Jesus isn't arriving, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually then, years later, he called to me, no, you can have both. Jesus and Elvis, you can have both. And that's the point. We don't need to repudiate everything moralistically that we enjoy, that we love, in order to be religious. Because in my opinion, and I got into trouble for this before, but I'll say it again, being religious is no more than being fully human. It's simply the inflation of your imagination to the point where it m corresponds to the universe. At the Temple of Apollo in Delphi in Greece, 
there's, upon entering the temple, there's three words, know thyself. Probably the most profound statement you could actually issue because it confronts you at that moment. It says, who are you? And are you worthy of entering the temple of Apollo? Do you have an understanding of yourself? Most people today don't know who they are. That's deliberately done. Now, I can remember, like, you know, if someone to say to me, who are you? There's one thing I can say, and this is like, think about the power of this. That fucking vaccine isn't inside me. That's who I am. I don't have to, and I'm not putting down people who are coerced into it. I'm not putting that, that I know people are terrible, terribly coerced into it. I did it out of love for their families. But that is not inside me. I didn't have to go to war. I didn't have to attack anybody. I didn't have to riot. I just said, no way, not a chance. And the more they got coercive about it, the stronger my resolve. And it became a very pleasant thing. It was almost like a good luck with that one. It, it, went, it went from like, you know, you know, they'll have to tie me down. They're like, tough shit, it's not happening. But it really, and it was beautiful because the, the, I wouldn't say I had a fear of it, but I was, I was pissed off, I was furious. How dare you think you can inject me with something uh, against my will? How dare you? You know, the, genocides are built on that kind of mentality, you know, in the past. And uh, that really bothered me. But it was, it was the moment that I said, see, so that's, I, know I'm, I, I, don't, I know I don't have that. It's not in me. So I'm aware of that. So that's one thing I can actually say I did. Now, Joseph Campbell, the phenomenal, amazing American mythologist, he talks about the hero's journey. And that your, your life is not just drudgery. You get up in the morning, you get a job, you get married, you get all that crap, right? But it's actually every single day of your life is an epic. So you might be called on to be a wizard in one part of the day. To bamboozle the boss out of like, you know, you didn't you call the then you were sick, right? You might have to you'd be a hero in the day. You might have to slay a dragon, you know, something like that. And in, in metaphorical terms. So you see your life as being something more than existence. You see it as a quest. And Jesus, it's incredible. It's amazing how that can really help you. Because you don't so you suddenly realize that there is a dynamic resolution to your life. You're not you say like I went through a really bad divorce, right? Well, you know, and it was horrible. I lost the house. You could say some of the kids don't like me. But I'm still here and I survived that and I'm not stuck in that unhappy life. But that was a triumph. We're, we're told to believe things like that are defeat. And you were talking about like, you know, can we make metaphor reality? You know, it's one thing to be all this like airy fairy about it, but how do you put that into practical terms? Tell that to Patrick Pierce. I mean, the 1916 Rising was built upon his metaphorical writings, big time. And they were enough to change the world. So uh, the metaphor, the allegory, the parable in itself doesn't do it. But it becomes like a seed that grows inside someone, somebody's consciousness. And they become the ones who bring it into fulfillment and bring it into action. So this is the, this, like, like Jerry and his crew have done here today, this didn't exist at one time, now it does. Look what's happened. So this has been brought into a reality. This is now a part of our existence. So if you treat every aspect of your life like that, like I, I'll never forget the day, now I was still angry, when they said all restrictions have been lifted and the Vax Pass is gone. I was like, yeah, you know, great. We survived the great battle. And you know, that's what it would have felt like. You're still angry that they try, they try to pull it on us. But it was a tremendous learning experience. And they wanted riots, I could tell that. You know, that's why they were, they, you can see they were goading them people. If they wanted riots as a further excuse to lock people down and stuff, especially around Christmas 2021, it got really dark. It was an awful Christmas, that. If you believe in a human soul, I think many of those people that, that impose that wickedness on us have lost their souls. From TV newsreaders, celebrities, and you can see it in them, you, don't you? Haven't they lost a certain charismatic power about them? And they're all, they're all re re retiring, you know, there's, they, they were full of piss and vinegar in 2018, <laughs> but now they have this kind of like, it's, it's unsure, right? 
and they don't look the same. They're, they're, the energetic force coming off their bodies is not, it's not there. You know, and you see these, these Egypts on RTA and they're not, they, they, were, they were loving that lockdown in the early days because they, they, they had us by the, you know, the metaphorical short and curlies. But that was a rush that burnt out on them. A friend of mine up in Northern Ireland called up a radio show. It's the biggest talk show in Belfast. And I can't remember the guy's name. Nolan. Not yet. And he said, um, Jamie, it was the name, chaps, chaps, chaps name. He said, I've known him for years up in the north. And he's, uh, he said to him, oh, people will be held accountable. And he goes, what do you mean? And he goes, and you will too. And there was radio dead silence. <laughs> and he, oh, it's, it's, you have to see it. Christian Morris has, it was, has a saved on his, on his Odyssey channel. He goes, what do you mean? Oh, you'll, you'll be held accountable too. You want to hear this? You could palpably hear, you know, the, the Within that space, that, that split second of silence was the entire history of the Roman Empire, <laughs> compressed. You could, you could actually see that he was cacking in his pants when he heard that. Ah, oh, but Jamie, we didn't know. Who was to know? I knew, you knew, you knew, you knew, you knew, we knew, my cat knew. <laughs> you know, it's amazing, it's amazing. So that, that kind of integration that, into your psyche of that feeling, is tremendously powerful, but they're frightened now. I can see, you can see the fear in the BBC ones. You can tell, and it's a nihilistic self-preservation fear. They're not afraid of an uprising or anything like that. They're like saying, oh shit, what have I done? You can always tell a cursed person. You know, like they always say, oh, he's a cursed person. And he'd always show a cartoon of this cloud over his head and the rain on them. <laughs> they all have that look now. They don't have that. That, that cockiness and arrogance they had, uh, unless they have their absolutely no personality at all, like most of the politicians, but the, the, you can see that. And even people I knew that were kind of a bit shitty, you know, oh, you're a you're granny killer, this kind of thing, you know? The irony now is they were the granny killers. How about that? How, and you tell me, you tell me we don't. So, the ones that called us granny killers were the granny killers. Now, you tell me that we don't live in a beautiful, malleable reality. Irony never lies. It all, it's so pure and true. And they, they, it, was, it, was the, it was almost like the worst kind of projection. You kill the grannies. You know, I can remember Torridy uh, on Mother's Day. Ah, sure, there's nothing like an Irish mammy, but we can't see them this year. You know, this kind of thing. Oh, it was sickening, wasn't it? You know, we look at him now. He's a broken man. I mean, I've nothing personal against him. He could be a very nice fellow in real life. I just don't know. But you sign that, you sign that contract with the devil. Even if you don't believe in the devil, the, the dark side will always, always settle the accounts at the end of the day. And they all know that. I know that for a fact. Big time. What I would like us to think about is uh, to look at our tradition of, hist of spiritual tradition in, in its extended form, the pagan phase, the Celtic Christian phase, the recent phase, and, and ask ourselves the question, given if we agree that it is not possible and there's no evidence that it is for a society to survive more than a generation or two after it dispenses with transcendent idea. It doesn't happen. A society falls apart within a generation or two. Uh, all, there's no evidence of a society enduring through time with, uh, without a transcendent belief. And given that that is the case, we owe it to future generations not to allow what is happening to continue. We need to arrest it and we need to reverse it. But that doesn't mean, I'm not standing here as a Catholic saying you must do it my way, because that would be not very proofful for all the reasons that we know. But we do have the makings, we do have the raw material in our history of, I think, a kind of, I would call it a fake it till you make it, exploration of the spiritual questions. In other words, that if you begin to go back into the culture for the sake of its history, for the sake of its meanings, for the sake of its personalities, for the sake of its stories, for the sake of its prayers, you may find yourself gradually being inculcated again in something that is extending your imagination willy-nilly. 
And this is really important. I, I was in AA for many years. And that it's a wonderful program for recovery because it posits the idea of God, as you understand him, to people who really at that point are at their lowest level and therefore have no faith in anything. And it says to you very gently, you know, do you believe in God? No? Well, you don't have to. Your higher power can be the light bulb. <laughs> or it can be the group. And what it actually does is make you, bring you in, almost by the hand, into a different version of reality, which is the spiritual, religious concept of reality. Not concept, but reality of reality. And it asks you to just then practice in a certain way, minimalist, but then observe the results. And that's what I did. I learned to pray again. You know, I've told these stories many times, I'll tell it again. I mean, I, 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 when I was joined AA first, I didn't know how to pray. I'd forgotten all the prayers that I learned as a child, and I had to learn them all again. Then a the guy who was kind of looking after me said to me one day, and then he asked me to describe how, what I do when I'm praying. How do, I, how do you pray? And I said, well, you know, I, I, just when I'm going around the place in the morning, I, I, I say these prayers. And he said, yeah, and, and where, where are you in that? Oh, you know, just walking around. Oh, so you don't get on your knees? I says, oh, no. <laughs> no, I couldn't do that. But what do you mean you couldn't do that? Just couldn't. My knees won't bend. <laughs> My knees refuse to bend for that purpose. <laughs> Why is that? I have no idea. But they won't. OK, he says, we have a solution. He says, tomorrow morning when you're putting on your shoes, throw one of them under the bed. <laughs> and you'll find you have to get on your knees to, to retrieve it. When you're down there, say those prayers, see what happens. Now, that sounds funny, but that's leading me back into a place where I was accompanied in my imagination, where I was certain of my footing, where I was certain of my journey, where I was moving in harmony with reality. And I did that. And then what happened? I noticed that all the stuff that was bothering me started just drain away. It works, if you work it. Now, the question is then, how can you do that to in a culture? That's a big question. I don't have the answer to that. I suspect you possibly can, but it's a very tricky operation, philosophically. Particularly a culture that has become, quote unquote, rational to the point where it dispenses, it dismisses these concepts. It dismisses what Thomas would call magic, and I don't disagree with the word. It is magic. This is a different realm, where the outcomes of things is different to what they would be if you behave differently, if you thought differently. The way I was somewhere, in our present situation, I, I actually, even though I'm not a positive person, I don't end my speeches with positive messages like chair people ask you to do is the reason you want to ask me for a positive message at the end and I'm going to say no, don't do it. But here's a positive message. We're going to win this war. How, how do I know that? I, ask yourself this, did this happen to you? I, this is my story. For the last couple, few decades of my life, I had felt that my life was increasingly directionless. I was just repeating myself. I was working in the Irish Times, writing the same article every week, you know, going on radio programs, talking shite, the same shite every week, you know. And, 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 you know, writing 840 words in the Irish Times, and if you wrote 841, they'd take one out, and it would be the most important word, you know. But then, you know, as soon as this thing started, I realized that my life had turned into a movie. And this was the final act. It had been a movie all along, but this was the final act. And I think that might be true for all of you. This is why you're alive now. This is why we're all here now. And the very fact that that has been arranged by whatever cosmic force we're talking about, God, Jesus, However, that means we cannot lose. 
if. If what? We cannot lose if we continue to do what we think is the right thing. That's all. It doesn't have to be the right thing, by the way. It can be completely wrong thing. You can complete, make complete arse of everything, provided your heart is in the right place. That's what I found in my life when I started to work that program of AA. That actually I would go into impossible situations that I had no solution to. Court problems, court cases and all this. I would, my life would be over. I would write my life off at 11 o'clock in the morning in, in the foyer of a courtroom. And at 3 o'clock I'd come out and say, Jesus, how did, I, how did that happen? That's a fucking miracle. Miracles happen when you believe in the possibility of miracles or even if you want to believe in the possibility of miracles and can't quite do it. Your intention is everything in this dimension. That's my experience. Years ago, I was, when I was a kid, I was working on a building site and there was a, an outfit there, a labourer from Tipperary. I need the worst accent I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> no offence, I'm not, if you come from Tipperary, but this guy, and it, I, I, it comes into work one day and he goes, they were all queers. <laughs> oh, they're a bunch of queers, they were all queers. And I go, who? He goes, the feckin', the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, they're a bunch of, they were all, oh, there was a documentary on last night, and oh, they were all, all the fellas were on the, and the, they were all a bunch of queers, all of them. And I was like, oh, okay, I wasn't homophobic. It didn't bother me in that way, but I was like, and then I, I went to look on it. There was books in the library, and all it talked about how the ancient Greeks lived in a bisexual society, and men took boys as lovers, and, and comrades had men on the battlefield were lovers and stuff. It's all lies. And it was sold as a part of a big part of a big part of a liberal agenda to corrupt real liberalism. There are eight. Wait, hear this one. We we all have been told the story that in ancient Greece the men, you know, the old joke, the the Greek army never leaves its buddies behind. But <laughs> <laughs> you weren't fast enough back there. But. but uh, there's 80,000 surviving artworks from ancient Greek that depict Grecians. Of the 80,000, only six of them depict homosexual acts between men. And that's all we ever see, isn't it? That's not all you ever see in, when you show Greek pottery. And they're satires. They're like carry-on films. They're not endorsing it. They're kind of like saying, this is how that guy down the road is. It's a <laughs> it's, it's, it, it was a satire. But I was told, even in school, in the school book said, oh, they were, you know, they were all very, you know, into bisexual and all this. Now that was used as part of an agenda, a part of a liberalization that like, well, the, the Greeks invented society and they had the highest level of sophistication and they were all, you know, doing it. <laughs> to the fellas, lads were all getting it on with each other. It's all bollocks, it's all absolute lies. And then I started to look at this further, right? And you hear about the, you know, do you remember the BBC show I, Claudius and films like uh, Caligula, the, the portraying the Romans as like degenerates, right? Well, they were not the average Roman person. The average Roman person looked upon, you know, people like uh, Caligula and, uh, and the rest of them as the Jimmy Savills of their time. That way, they were the Epstein Islanders of their day. The ordinary Romans, had a very high level of morality in terms of that. And there was, you know, they, 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 they were not, they were not values that the elite, the, that the royal families of Rome had that everyone in Roman society looked up to. Now you see how they're changing things. Uh, they seem to be, they, they love to take a thing and change it and say, oh, you know, it, it, these people are so sophisticated and they were all bisexual. Well, firstly, why is it important that they're bisexual? That doesn't, doesn't, why would that interest even interest anyone, right? Because they're reducing you down, what the Hindus call your base chakras, to the lowest level of thinking, where you know, you're basically turned into uh, someone who has a very 
a poor self of spiritual progression. You're always living in your, in your wife fronts, that kind of thing. You're always thinking with your yin yang. And they were, that's how they, that's, that was all part of that, to reduce the society of Greece that had created remarkable artworks, Parthenon, gave us our civilization, gave us everything really that we have called Western civilization. And then saying, ah, but you know, all these fellas were all getting it on. And you see, and that's because they're doing that. that they, they don't want to say, God, God, these guys were amazing. You know, it's all about the degeneracy of the establishment. The really bad stuff that goes on up the top, right? They're constantly trying to normalize it to the rest of us. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a prediction here. In the next few years, they're going to try and somehow, in some way, reduce the age of consent really low. And they're going, to, and a lot of that has to do with what they don't want to knock on the door of the guards one day. And that's what's happening in England, happening in America, but we are a test case for that. And it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight, you cannot go down that road. You know, that you, can't, you cannot even, what's the word? For a second even think that could be allowed. Not for a second. You know, and you're going to see TV shows about, you know, some Greek philosopher had a boy lover and this kind of thing, you know? And you're going to have it come integrated into songs and TV shows and sitcoms. This is, this is the greatest battle we will face as a civilization uh, because no civilization in, in, in the history of the world has ever done that, that's, that ever. It, it usually was a result of something really bad, but it would never happen as a, part, as a course. They want to bring the human race down to zero, below degeneracy. Why? It's a transhumanist thing. Everything yeah. that makes a human a human, the natural sense of natural justice, they want to obliterate it. And it, that was the, the whole lockdown was all about that, you know? Mm. Report, you know, I, I see things online, oh, my neighbors are out doing shopping while they're supposed to be locked down, should I report to the guards? And then someone's saying, oh, maybe you should. And it's like, where is your human decency gone? You know, we had to look at some people. You know, one of the things that I think was most upsetting for many people, not for me, because I was, I never liked anyone anyway, but it was like, <laughs> was how dark, you know, the, do you remember the question we all grew up with? How did the Holocaust happen? Now we know, now we know. The monster next door, the monster down the street, you know? So what, they're, what those people are capable of is uh, projecting their own inner dysfunctionality on us and then trying to normalize it. And I think they're, they're not finished yet. But it's obviously a battle they've lost. It's over. There's no, they're not going to go that way. It won't happen. I mean, you may get someone to put a mask on. I mean, I know in Ballymoon, if anyone even suggested that, they'd, they'd kill him, you know, when I was growing up, you know? That, that sh and, and here they are. They're, getting, they're inching towards it. Why the drag queen story time? What the, what the hell is that all about? Why the need for that? You know, the need for that is they're sexualizing children on purpose. And that's why they're changing the school curriculums. These... <laughs> We have to understand the wickedness of what we're up against. It's like we got a taste of it with the lockdown, but that, that poison is still there. And we have to be vigilant about it and take no quarter, you know, that kind of a thing. And they're afraid of it because they know that's the one dice they'll throw if they roll it too early. But the, the ultimate destruction of Western civilization would be that. And they'll do it because they have no... They have no feeling you know if i was to ask for Radgar one question do you love ireland just simply yes or no how profound is that you know they're done I, you say we're going to win the war we've already won it because we we wouldn't be here if we hadn't already been won we're like we're basically what's the word reviewing the battle you know but they're it's it, they're, they're they're ready for the final one they want to test us you see they uh, i know it sounds weird but a lot they really are driven by sadism they do like upsetting us. They do, I mean, I found that, as a, found that as a very early age. Like, you'd watch the evening news, unemployment is up, there's no money for this, you're gonna be, have a crap Christmas. And why do you need to tell me that? And this is an important one for us, don't self-hex yourself. Just because they want transhumanism, don't say, oh, we're gonna get transhumanism. 
or they're going to do this, they're going to legalise that, they're going to bring in mandatory this, mandatory. Don't do that. And stay away from people who are nihilistic that way. Because they will act, that, you can actually self-hex that into reality. They want you doing that. They want, so that's a very important one. Don't, don't let them self-hex you anymore. It's very interesting. The people who resisted, they weren't necessarily religious people in a recognisable way all the time. But a lot of them were as well. And they were a particular kind. They weren't just Sunday mass course. There were people who took it seriously. Or maybe followed a little bit of the social teaching of the church or the anthropological, you know, the adequate anthropology that John Paul used to talk about. Well, that would mean that they actually put together a model of the human person in reality and, and understood about the limits of humanity in different directions, which is kind of what I'm talking about, that idea of moving through, you know, and then the question, the question of desire, you know, and, and that Freudian notion of sublimation, you know, that, that Western civilization was born of the sublimation of human desire. It's a really interesting concept, and I think there's a lot in it. This was an attack which followed a long period of brainwashing of the general, in general, the human race. And the people who resisted were the ones who had been least affected by that brainwashing, who were still intact in their basic understanding of the parameters of, of reality. They just knew that certain things were wrong. They knew that it cannot be right that an 85-year-old woman who has reared her family and has her family have reared children to maybe to the ages of five or six, whom she adores. And she is not permitted to say goodbye to those people as she is told she is dying from a deadly disease. She's dying because of the mass murder campaign orchestrated by the government using ventilators, stress, and medazolam, more than likely. And everybody in the system goes along with that, including the clergy, generally speaking, the bishops. Not one voice at a senior level in the Catholic Church in Ireland was raised against these obscenities, nor has it yet been raised against these obscenities. That itself is an obscenity. <laughs> to go back to the topic of faith and religion, I was, from what I said, you know, I mean, I didn't, I'm not talking about my beliefs. I'm talking about the structural presence of, or infrastructural presence, perhaps, of religion in the society. Because I believe that whereas that's not vital to me as a person, it's vital to the promulgation of these ideas into the future. You need some kind of a, an institution, some kind of a mechanism whatever shape it takes. And far more important than the claim of any particular religion is the idea of maintaining and renewing that transcendent impulse in society through our education system, through our media, through our culture. And I don't know how, you know, I don't have the, the, the blow by blow description of how that might be done. You know, as I say, it's not, it's not simple, it's not like, you know, you just ban pop music or something. I don't want to do that. I wouldn't want to do that. I love pop music. Not all of it. But quite a bit of it. You know, what's happened to us is extraordinary. Because it has been a complete inversion of our moral order. You just think about it. Like About a decade ago, we were talking about, all the time, about the evils of paedophilia. The worst thing in the world. There was nothing you could be called in the world that is worse than a paedophile. People spat the word. People, people, they were sending around their names. If they move into a new neighborhood, everybody knows who they are, that they've had it being sentenced, if they're a sex offender. Now, we're expected to believe that that was all a mistake. No, no, we didn't, that really, no, don't take it too seriously. That was a misunderstanding, that was a backward, generation way back in the noughties used to think like that. We're progressive now. We want to legalize paedophilia. We want to bring down the age of consent. We want drag queens to read stories to your children. Sticking their arses out on your days. Don't call me a paedophile, call me a minor attractive person. I'm very, very sorry. <laughs> very sorry, yes. <laughs> I call you a nonce, if you don't mind. <laughs> 
you know, we, we need to get real about this stuff. Like, this sort of live and let live has, has virtually nearly strangled our, our country. These people have just crept up on us, they've bullied us, they've screamed us down, they've cancelled us, they've, they've defamed us. And now they're coming for our children. But now is the time to say no, enough. Stop right there, buddy. There's the door. When I was talking about the referendum in 2015 and raising questions about the constitutional definitions of marriage and parenting and family and why, how important they were to preserve, uh, I got obviously a lot of stick. But I remember getting a phone call from a German journalist one day, you know, and she seemed quite interested in, in what I was saying. So I started to explain it to her, and, you know, about the Constitution, Article 41, blah, 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 blah. And then she interrupts it, but you're a Catholic, aren't you? And I said, ah, oh, gotcha, gotcha. That's the reduction. It's a reduction which is as much contributed to by Catholicism as it is by its uh, antithesis, as, as its enemies. Because the formulation that I would put forward is something like this. My attitude to marriage is not formulated by my Catholicism in any way. It actually happens to be that the view expressed by the Catholic Church is very close to mine. It's not identical. I have other views about, say, situations where there are children in a mar non marital situation or in a post marital situation which the church doesn't agree with. But my point is this, that, that I won't say it's a coincidence. What it is is that we are both using our reason, the church in its way, to history, and me to the history of my own life, observing what I see working and what I see not working, and applying that to my opinions. It's a, co it's a happenstance, which just happens to be more or less the same. But morality, you don't need morality as a part of the program of religion. Morality is part of human existence. I spoke earlier on about self-hexing yourself and don't do it, right? So the evening news says, we're heading for a recession. <laughs> Me? No. The, the, you know, don't lose that, learn to change your language. Yeah. So don't say, oh Jesus, you know, the, this AI is coming in. Yeah. No, it's not, it's not for me. It may be for you, but it's not for me. And don't impose your debt cult, debt watch, upon me. Oh, you know, they're gonna have, they're gonna have a bigger lockdown next time. We, we, are you making decisions for me personally? Learn how to speak in positive language. And that way you're using the system to undermine itself. I'll give you an example of using the system to undermine yourself. When I was 15, I badly needed 50 pounds, me and a friend. And there was a competition in the Ballymun Comprehensive for an anti-drugs poster. And I won it. And I, it was a picture of a fella inside a prison made of syringes, you know, an anti-heroin poster. And it, it won first prize. We needed the 50 pound to buy LSD because we wanted to try it. <laughs> and, 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 and I was given the prize by the Garda commissioner. And he's sitting there going, y y young lads like you are a credit to this country. Not only do you do this amazing artwork and you stand up against drugs. The tabs were 25 pounds each at the time or something. We'd read, I think, Naked Lunch by Burroughs or something. We said, we have to try this LSD stuff and get it somehow. And, but that wasn't wrong, it wasn't immoral, you know. I, we weren't buying heroin, we were selling heroin, and we did, we, I never touched anything like that. But it was, uh, it was all we had to do to, you know, we wanted to experience a better life, a, a different life, we wanted a richer life, and we were poor kids in like an inner city area, and we didn't have money, we had nothing. And although, it, it, there was a, I know it, 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 there is an element of it's not, it wasn't very nice. I, I think it was kind of actually because the poster still did the job. It was still presented as an anti-drugs poster and LSD is not like heroin or something like that. But it was, it taught me earlier on that like, they do that to us all the time. They lie to us all the time. Things like a TV license, you know, you've got to pay for your propaganda, you know. And, and, and then they say, but then you have to be play fair. So you have to be paid to be psychologically terrorized by Claire Bourne every night during the COVID. 
and then they'll say to you, well, you have to be fair. Now, I'm not saying we should all break the law and do things like that, but there's a nuanced way of living that can actually skirt around both. And you can find it very empowering, you know, to sort of like get one up on the system. I'm not telling them to break laws or do anything evil. But there's like, you know, I remember I was, I was going beyond the three kilometer distance and it felt great. And I would stand on the line, I would jump over and, go, and then jump back and this kind of thing. And it, 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 that, that's, that's, that's what makes life worth living. Because it's, it, you're, you're, putting down a, you're putting down a mandate. You don't owe me, you only think you owe me. Because if the law is an ass, it's, I believe your job is to break it, you know, that kind of thing. So that's a very important thing. So positivity is doing things that liberate you from your oppression. I don't think people, I don't think, even think I fully realise just how oppressive the last three years. As I get further away from it, it's actually getting darker for me. You know, it's actually getting darker for me. And it's like the only thing that kept it going was we were bewildered. And there's a huge part of the whole programming. And that's why some people love the lockdown, because they had basic rules. They had the washing, the steps, the mask. And those people need rules. And they were comforted by that like a safety blanket. So that's why you'd have these personality types like, oh, they can't end the lockdown. They're the people that we have to avoid really badly, because they're the ones who act totalitarian is really built on. Oh, Jesus, we have to do it. The most evil phrase in the history of the world is, we've got to do it for the greater good. Yeah. Every totalitarian, from Pol Pot to Rothbottom, all use that. The greater good is only, it, it is relative. There you go. <laughs> um, did you, I think an important distinction to be made, and I, I tried to make it at the beginning, because when I said, I'm not here to talk about my beliefs, I'm not here to talk about what I think is true, what isn't true. What we're here to talk about is the societal constructs which enable the transmission of ideas and beliefs. That's an entirely different thing to what I decide to do in my life, what I, what I believe, who I love, all that. It's a very complex thing to construct a culture, particularly when it's been devastated over many years by malevolent actors, which ours has. So we're in the process of trying to discuss how we're going to reconstruct a culture capable of transmitting core necessities of any functional culture, a culture that will endure as the one we're at the end of, or hopefully not, but as I say, he's lying in the bed, it's not looking good, and Jesus still hasn't arrived. You know, love, I'm sorry, but love is a kind of a blackmail word. It's used a lot in, in public discourse. You know, do you love enough? Oh, do, but what about love? Uh, love is love. Hear that one? So in other words, you have to do what we want in order to show that you believe that love is love. There's actually a song, Love is All You Need. Yeah. They didn't write that one either. <laughs> and where was, and where, where was that first broadcast, a worldwide global broadcast on the BBC? It was shown all over the world on the same day to everybody. And it was, you can tell, you, now you look at that thing now and you go, that was a psyop. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the video. Okay, what's the best way to defeat your enemies? Getting them to love unconditionally and love thy neighbor. At the time in the 60s, there was a lot of, uh, in America it was blowing up, there was a lot of, a lot of things happening, the civil rights movement, Martin, you know, Martin Luther King and, J and Malcolm X were shot. Things were bubbling, there was a real rage bubbling up all over the world. They put that out there to say, ah, just love everybody. But that didn't address things like Jim Crow, or it didn't stop the uh, assassination of loads of people. You know, it's, it's, it's a dopamine rush in, in, in replacement for something that you really sorry. need. Sorry, Tom. And, and at right this moment, the concept of love, loving the world, is being used to sledgehammer our country into rubble. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's, it's a very thing, easy thing to say. You don't expect to, somebody to disagree with you when you talk about love. <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you that I, I see this as a problem. When anybody starts coming to me and saying, oh, but do you not have love in your heart? They want something from me. <laughs> They want something from me. They want me to, to amend my behavior so they can get something that they're looking for. And that's what's happening here. Irish people are being told that if you want to show that you love, 
you've got to give up your home. And your children's home. That's what love will mean. There is no mechanism that I know of, culturally or otherwise, by which you can generate love as though it were on tap. It just doesn't happen like that. It's a response which occurs in human hearts because they live in a functional culture in the first place. And my question is, how do we make that culture functional so we can all love the ones we want to love and hate the ones that deserve our hate? And they are no small number either. I find satire is very powerful because it has two things. One, it mocks the, the oppressor, and two, it bamboozles them. Like, I don't, I, people are amazed that I've never, been, I've never been thrown off YouTube because they can't understand me. I, <laughs> the Irish Times did a thing on all these evil conspiracy theorists who are trying to end the lockdown and kill your granny, and this one particular very popular one has a huge following. They played my voice but they didn't mention my name. You know why? Because if they all came to my channel, they'd be laughing and I would own them. And, <laughs> and, that's, and that, that's, they, they were afraid that of the fact that I was funny, I could be funny, and that's what frightened them. And there was also that list that came out, and you told me that, of the, ba the Gates Foundation, all the anti-lockdown. I, I was disgusted I wasn't on it. <laughs> And I, I was probably, I should have been the top of the list, but you said, the reason why they'll come on and you'll have them laughing and they won't say, oh, he's not so bad, you know? You know? Uh, and see, the, so be yourself. You know, have a smile on your face. And uh, satire is unbelievably powerful. It, it has brought down kingdoms in the past, you know? And that's a, that's a very Irish pagan bardic thing. The bard could write a satire that could make fun of a chieftain not only would it destroy him, but it would destroy his whole succession, his whole line. So our pagan ancestors and Christian ancestors in the Breton laws, they held the bard at the top. At the top. Why? Because he had the power that could take the king down. And also the king, there was a symbiotic relationship. The chieftain and the king wanted the bard there because it was almost like, almost like a measuring, a countermeasurement force. You know, so the, the jester would come in and go, have you seen the king's new trousers? And the king laughs. That was all part of the game. That's why they allow satire, but they, they, they've tried to stop it in recent years. There's been a war on comedy, a terrible war on comedy. Look at sitcoms, they're terrible and everything else. So satire is fantastic. You can't make a monster out of someone who makes you laugh. Or someone puts a smile on your face. You can't do it. You know, and they want, they, want, they want stereotypes. They want someone, I hate the government. I, I'm going to start a trouble. They don't want people uh, talking in code words like I use. That's how I get around the algorithms. I feel sorry for people that have read my books and then come onto my Facebook page and hear me talking about that I'm a four foot nine lesbian. But that's to, that's to destroy the algorithms. I do, I've, I love those kinds of stories, you know. Be undefinable. That's what I say. And have you noticed the left and all the, the or even the right, but the left especially, they're obsessed with categorization. You're this, he's that, I'm this, you're this. Uh, we're the popular front of Judea, we're the Judean popular front. That's one of the reasons why they're always doomed, you know that? Because if you look at the history of the Paris Commune, it was a, a socialist paradise. As soon as they got power, uh, the, the leaders all turned on each other. I'm more of a communard than you. You're not a good, you know, they, they, so their nature is to attack. They need something to attack. That's why, that, that's why those regimes, they've always been fatal. And so, but they have no sense of humour. And that's one of the things you, they, they, you, you will find in totalitarian countries, they don't have a sense of humour. It's not allowed, you know, it's, it's not allowed. And I think, and this is something, that's one of the things that makes me incredibly proud of being Irish, is that we're unbelievably funny by nature. Well, and, and that's always made us difficult to control. I was in Cork yesterday and I was hearing two fellas chatting and I was just, they were I don't know what they were talking about, but I was roaring and laughing at the way they'd used their language and stuff. And you, you go into a bus in Dublin or in the west of Ireland, anywhere, there's, a, there's something unbelievably beautiful about our people and our ability to be funny. It is our secret weapon, it really is, big time. What Thomas was saying there about love and anger put a, n a name into my head, and that name was John Lydon. 
um, Johnny Rotten, whose father was from Chum in County Galway. I think his mother from up there as well. But John, John Lydon was the voice of rage in the, at the end of the 70s, the voice, the voice of anger. And now, today, he's the personification of love. A man who cares in an era where, which dumps its elderly into homes and walks away from them. He's taking care of his, of his beloved wife in the last years of her life to the extent that he refuses to leave his home for any more than a day and returns immediately the first opportunity he gets. This tells us, you know, there's no, there's no simple um, emotion that we can reach for and solve our problems with. It isn't to do with our refusal to be one way or the other. It's not to do with our inability to understand our enemy, except in the sense that we need to understand what they're doing so that we can stop them doing it. We don't need to understand everybody. That's a myth. We don't need to. We don't need to tolerate everybody. A lot of people are intolerable, let's be honest. <laughs> a lot of people are hateful. The most hateful people in this country are the people who are bringing in the hate speech laws. Why? Because they hate speech. All this goes to the point that I, I, I think is my central point, that we live in a, in a destroyed culture, a rubble culture, it's a, a bulldozed culture, but we can still rebuild it if we understand what has happened. And it's hard, it's very hard, because I, I, my, I, my brain is in knots trying to find words to describe what is happening. How could you possibly have lived through the last three years and not realise there was a war on? But I, can't, I can only understand things to a certain point. And I can only understand things in my mind a lot of the time. And then one day, a realisation hits my body in the form of an illness or a pain that I can't dislodge. And it will not leave until I finally integrate that feeling with my awareness. That's how bad this is. That the, the level of, un the unprecedented level of what we're encountering is such that it's actually making us ill, enforcing us to find words to describe it. It's impossible, very often. How do you explain how a phenomenon like Michael D. Higgins, who prated all his life about truth and justice and beauty and so on, and behaves now like a blackguard to his own people. I don't have words for this. I knew him. I knew him. I drank with him. You know, I interviewed him. I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm beside myself in trying to comprehend this. It's a great danger that people will go away from this, that the prescription is a religious one. It's not a religious one, in that sense. If you mean by religion that some were calling on the bishops, that the bishops will now be called in and they will line up and explain to you what's going to happen next and so on and so on. That ain't going to happen, boys and girls. That ain't going to happen. Not in my watch. I don't want us to anywhere near this place. They have disgraced themselves. It is our job as people, as citizens, as parents, as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, it is our job to begin to think about the process of reconstruction of our culture. With these, I think, I suggest, and there may well be, and there are, I'm sure, many others, these considerations in mind. How do we rebuild our culture so that we, our imagination can expand rather than contract? How can it make us bigger in reality rather than smaller? How can it make us more confident rather than more afraid? How do we repossess our country? How do we become again as proprietors, not as slaves, not as unwelcome guests? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves. We live in hateful times. Our government hates us, be in no doubt. Our government does not love us. It would love to say, oh, you don't love each other enough. If you loved you, us, each other, and us more, we would be fine. Fuck off. <laughs> Ultimately, what John and I are taught here today is the continuation of the, the Irish spirit, right? Whatever, how you'd ever define that.
Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, Christian, atheist, pagan, doesn't matter, right? It's always worth bearing in mind that the Vikings came here, the Normans came here, the British Empire came here, we had the famine, we had the Confederacy War. We had unbelievable horrors foisted upon us, an atrocious tr struggle for independence. The Boomtown Rats second album. <laughs> One horror after the next, okay? <laughs> We're still here, I'll leave it at that. <laughs>